a very good morning to one and all present here for this special lecture organized by discipline of english chennai goa school of languages and literature goa university i purva naik program director ma english welcome you all heartily here this special lecture titled the mythology of the human heart and its metaphors by dr j anthony gomes is happening here today and it's my privilege to introduce our guest speaker for today to this august audience dr j anthony gomes also antonio gomes nom de plume and commonly referred to as tony hails originally from goa india he studied in both english in mumbai and portuguese in goa besides english he fluently speaks portuguese spanish kokni and understands french and hindi he immigrated to the us in 1970 after his medical schooling after specializing in cardiology at the mount sinai medical center and va hospital in the bronx he super specialized in cardiac electrophysiology at the usphs cardiopulmonary laboratory under the tutelage of dr anthony n damato he subsequently joined the down state medical school and center as director of the coronary care unit and electrophysiology laboratory at the va medical center brooklyn new york he was subsequently recruited by the mount sinai medical center in new york as head of its cardiac electrophysiology and electrocardiography department which he established in 1984 he is currently a professor of medicine and director of the electrophysiology consultative services at a, as a senior consultant at the leona m and harry b hensley charitable trust center for cardiac electrophysiology and the zena and michael a vena cardiovascular institute the mount the mount senior sinai medical center a pioneer in the field of cardiac electrophysiology he is credited for establishing the first modern cardiac electrophysiology section and laboratory in nyc he has been consistently listed in the best doctors and top doctors in new york the best doctors in america and featured in indians in new york and india abroad he has authored more than 180 original scientific publications more than 10 chapters in national international textbooks of cardiology lectured at national and international symposia and published two textbooks in cardiology entitled signal average electrocardiography concepts methods and applications and heart rhythm disorders history mechanisms and management perspectives uh i'm also happy to tell you that sir has gifted two of his books to discipline of english one of them being have a heart and the other one heart rhythm disorders he also published a book titled rhythms of broken hearts in 2021 the other book he has to his credit and particularly those that would be of interest to students of literature are have a heart in which he has explored the intertwined romantic and professional lives of three individuals a topic romance between a patient and a doctor and the clash of cultures the political upheavals of our times he also authored the sting of peppercorns which is a brilliant a uh, brilliantly crafted, crafted story that unfolds like a canvas imbued with a profound sensibility and a sense of foreboding he takes us on history love death the conflicts of assimilation and the cultural modes of the people of his native goa he also contributed an uh, a chapter to goa a post colonial society between cultures that's a book an anthology which is a compilation of essays based on an international conference held at yale university and he has also uh, authored a collection of poems titled mirror uh, mirrored reflection i uh, bring to you this 
speaker for today, Dr. J. Antonio Gomes. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Snyder, for your kind words of introduction. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, Dr. Isabel de Santeri de Vaj, uh, as well as Dr. Nina Calvera, uh, for arranging this talk, or for interceding for peace to arrange this talk. And it is indeed a great pleasure for me to lecture at the Shanoi Goenbab School of Languages and Literature at Goa University. Uh, I am by profession, uh, as mentioned, a cardio an academic cardiologist, uh, and my super speciality is cardiac electrophysiology. So it's not surprising that my interest in the history of the human heart uh, is of paramount interest. Uh, so today, I will not be talking about uh, uh, diseases of uh, heart rhythm, or sudden cardiac death, or disease of the heart, but rather the mythology of the human heart. I think that you can turn the lights off a little bit, if you don't mind. I think I probably will be able to manage. Uh, some of what uh, I will be talking uh, is addressed in this book, Heart Rhythm Disorders, History, Mechanisms and Management. It is indeed the first book that uh, uh, that talks about the history of the human heart. And uh, Rhythms of Broken Hearts, which actually is addressed to the lay public as well as patients and their caretakers, was published, I think, in 2022. And metaphorically speaking, uh, Have a Heart, which is a novel. Uh, in the mythology of the human heart, I will address the following issues. Uh, the ancient Egyptian view of the heart, the ancient Indian view of the heart, the ancient Greek view of the heart, the Renaissance heart, which is not mentioned here, the age of science, William Harvey, the discoverer of circulation of blood and others, the broken heart syndrome, the question is, can the heart feel? And some of heart's metaphors. Now, since uh, history, my talk uh, envelops history, some amount of philosophy, and much of literature as well, I will, accepting obviously some exclusions because of time factors, I will. Uh, stay on the dictum of uh, Miguel de Cervantes and Don Quixote, who mentioned, who said that historians ought to be precise, faithful and unprejudiced, and be the interest of here. Hatred nor affection should make them serve from the way of the truth. The heart, uh, as you know, has been likened since time immemorial to a household of divinity, the giver of life, and that of the immortal soul. Historically speaking, the heart has been characterized as a seat of emotions uh, for centuries. And although we know so much about the heart, um, mechanistically, uh, physiologically, anatomically, 
and regarding basic science and genetics, still, even today, the heart is characterized as a seat of emotions. It all began with the Egyptians, the ancient Egyptians. The heart was the seat of the soul in ancient Egypt. In Egyptian mythology, the heart of Ib was seen as part of the soul. It was the only organ left in the body of Egyptian mummies, particularly in those of nobles and elites, their hearts considered integral to the afterlife. Sometime in 2500 BC, a young woman in her 30s or 40s died in ancient Egypt. Uh, this is her coffin in the British Museum. Now, she was about five feet tall, and she came from noble families. Uh, the coffin was incredibly well preserved. The x-rays of the coffin, of the mummy, as well as the CAT scan showed that the only organ that was preserved was the heart. The rest of the organs, the brains, the uh, intestines, everything was taken away. So why keep the heart? Well, in ancient Egypt, death was not the end of life. Uh, the soul would traverse to the underworld and encounter a lot of difficulties. And after that, the soul would enter uh, the Hall of Two Truths, where it would encounter the Lord Anubis, who would weigh the heart, as seen over here, against the feather of Mark. The feather of Mark, it was an ostrich feather symbolizing the goddess of truth, balance, and morality. And if the heart was lighter or equal in weight to the feather of Mark, that meant that the, that the person or the mummy or the person was chaste and she would enter Aru or the heavenly paradise and live there for eternity. eternity. However, without a heart, she couldn't go to heaven. And therefore, the heart was the only organ that was preserved in the mummy. The oldest Hindu scriptures, the Vedic texts, circa 1500 to 1000 BCE, considered the heart or Hridya derived from Tirid or center, a light of consciousness. In the Rig Veda, the human heart is a sacrificial fire altar and more the cosmic axis. In the later Hindu scriptures of the Upanishads, the heart is the source of the immortal soul or the self, Atma. The shining self dwells hidden in the heart Everything in the cosmos, great and small, lives in the self, the source of life. Metaphorically, it is a majestic concept, the entire universe dwelling in one's heart, one's soul. We come now to the Greeks. Aristotle considered the, considered the heart to be the origin of the soul the seat of thought, reason, and emotion. He reinforced the cardiocentric view of the soul held by the Egyptians. Hellenistic philosophy, founded in Athens by Zeno of Scythium and Shisis of Soli, the Stoics, articulated a concept of the soul governed by a single principle, the hegemonicon located in the heart. 
our hegemony actually comes, hegemony implying center of primacy comes from the word hegemonicon. The Roman physician, Aulus Galenus, or better known as, uh, as Galen of Pergamon, challenged Yeah, he challenged the Aristotelian and the Stoic view. Uh, he was a physician, and he was a physician to gladiators uh, in Pergamon, which is now Turkey. And he was well aware of the injuries to the gladiators, particularly related to nerve injuries and trauma and so on. He posited that the brain was the organ responsible for governing thoughts, sensations, and movements, and thus the seat of the soul. Well, he was also a, a, a great showman. Once when he went to Rome, uh, he gave a demonstration to the senators, and he bought a pigling who was oinking, and cut the religious nerve, and the pigling stopped oinking. And that's how he showed that it's the brain that controls the body and not really the heart. Uh, he then became uh, the chief physician of, uh, to Emperor Marcus Aurelius. However, uh, his views of, on the circulation of blood were complex and led to erroneous conception of the heart for ages in Europe. He viewed the circulatory system as two separate one-way systems rather than a single unified system. He believed that venous blood was formed in the liver and arterial blood in the heart, and both circulated throughout the body separately. So he and this idea of circulation and of the heart remained in Europe until almost the 17th century. In the Bible, the thoughts of evil men are placed in your hearts. And Exodus 10, 1 speaks of the Lord heartening Pharaoh's heart. In the Old Testament, the words of King David, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Deuteronomy 6, 5 teaches us to love your Lord, your God, with all your heart. The Sacred Heart of Jesus and the Immaculate Heart of Mary a traditional Roman Catholic images universally worshipped in Catholicism. We now come to the Renaissance period. The Renaissance period stimulated uh, the uh, understanding of the anatomy of, the, uh, uh, of man, of human beings. And it was the great Leonardo da Vinci who took an interest in the heart. Leonardo da Vinci was a great painter. He painted the Mona Lisa, the Last Supper, Salvatore Mondi, and he was also an architect, an engineer, as well as a scientist. And sometime in 1504 to 1508, he took an interest in the heart. Uh, he was, he visited the Santa Maria Nueva Hospital in, um, in Florence, and there he met a man who was 100 years old, and the man told him that, uh, you know, I feel okay, excepting I feel weak, and uh, when he was there, the man suddenly died. Leonardo did something unheard of. Uh, he made, he, without any medical background, he did an autopsy on this man. And he found that it proceeded from weakness to the failure of blood and of the artery that treats the heart and the other lower members, which I found very dry, shrunk, shrunken, and withered. It is thought that he was the first 
to describe atherosclerosis in man. He also took an interest in the heart, and he described that the, that the heart has two major chambers, the right ventricle and the left ventricle separated by the septum. He also said the heart is a muscle, and it doesn't warm the blood as it was previously thought. He also attributed the pulse as a function of the heart. This is a rather famous painting uh, that I saw in Barcelona, and it attracted my eye. And this is a painting done by Pablo Picasso when he was only 15 years old, and it's titled Science and Charity. He painted it in 1897. And in the painting, he shows this doctor who actually, he used his own father as the model. This is Pablo Picasso's father, uh, Jose Ruiz Blasco, examining the pulse of a very sick, sick patient. He's counting the pulse as well as he obviously is trying to learn its characteristics as well. Well, since antiquity, the pulse has had a lofty and mysterious position in medical practice. Physicians viewed it not only as a surrogate for the heart, but as evidence of the health of other organs. Uh, this is not surprising, you see, because in those times there were no tests. There was no x-rays. So the only thing that they could do is feel the pulse. And of course, they obviously had great imagination. And they, they obviously spent even maybe half an hour to an hour to feel the pulse. And they actually attributed all sorts of diseases, like disease of the liver, disease of the gastrointestinal system, even uh, psychosomatic diseases to the pulse, obviously erroneously, but nonetheless, it's of historical uh, value. So the first was the Everest Papyrus, which dates back to about 1550 BC, over a thousand years before Hippocrates. Then as far back as 600 BCE, the Chinese physician, Qin Slo, asserted the importance of the pulse in the diagnosis and the prognosis of disease. The ancient Indian Ayurveda physician, Sagi Kanar, used the pulse to diagnose diseases. By the way, it is felt that the Ayurveda physicians were the first to measure the pulse weight, described as per pal, with each pal equating 24 seconds. The ancient Greeks and Romans Avicenia, or even Sinai, and Maimonides, as well as Galileo Galilei, also examined the pulse and tried to diagnose diseases by examination of the pulse. It was finally the English physician Sir John Floyer in 1670, in, in 1730 30s, who first counted the pulse rate as it as we count it in the current form. Now, the, <clears throat> the Everest Papyrus, or the Rosetta Stone of ancient Egyptian medicine, is of tremendous historical interest. Uh, Ebers, George Ebers, was a German Egypt Egyptologist. And he was in Paris, now Luxor. He was actually uh, looking for some antiquities. And a man approached him and gave him uh, a, a papyrus, uh, which I, uh, but before that, in a box, there was a figure of the god Osiris, which, act, uh, which actually was probably uh, done about a year back. And he also gave him, uh, and, uh, and uh, George Evers thought that it was of no value, but told him, that if you come up with something, uh, really some antiquity, I would be willing to pay.
And so he came back the next day and he gave him a box. The box, when he opened it, had mummy clothes and there was a papyrus which was extremely well preserved. And it probably dated to 1550 BC. And Evers then uh, brought the papyrus to, uh, to Germany. However, in that papyrus, which was 69 uh, feet uh, in length, there was a chapter on the heart. And it says, in the heart are the vessels to the whole of the body. As to these, every physician, every shaket priest, every magician will feel them when he lays his finger on the head, on the back of the head, on the hands, on the stomach region, on the arms, on the legs, implying that everywhere he feels his heart because its vessels run to all his limbs. In other words, Physicians place their hands all over the body, but they are really examining the heart because it beats before they feel the pulse elsewhere. <coughs> Finally, we come to the modern day, modern uh, science, and it was, uh, after all, William, the, the Englishman, William Harvey, who, who actually studied uh, scientifically the heart, particularly the anatomy of the heart and the physiology, uh, he discovered the circulation of blood and, in, uh, and he got married actually to the daughter of the royal physician to Queen Elizabeth and then in 1618 he became royal physician to King James I and later to King Charles I. Uh, he wrote a book, of course at that time the language of scholars was Latin, entitled Exercitatio Anatomica de Motocordis et Sanguinis in Animalibus. This was published in 1628 and two decades later it was translated in English on the motion of the heart and the blood in living beings. <coughs> He expounded that the heart was actively at work when it was small, hard and contracted, what we now call systole, when the heart <coughs> contracts, expelling blood and at rest when it was large and filled with blood, diastole, when it's relaxing. He said that the heart's one role is the transmission of blood and its propulsion by means of the arteries to the extremities everywhere. Yet, he did not entirely challenge the metaphysical interpretation of the heart. He also wrote, the heart, consequently, is the beginning of life, the sun of the microcosm. Even as the sun in its turn might well be designated the heart of the world. For it is the heart by whose virtue and pulse the blood is moved, perfected, and made nutrient and is preserved from corruption and coagulation. It is the household divinity which, discharging its function, nourishes, cherishes, and quickens. Of course, beautifully written, we don't find such writing in these days. His concept of circulation of blood came under heavy fire at first, since Gallen had been a towering influence for several centuries in Europe. Many doctors actually said that they would rather err with Galen than proclaim the truth with Harvey. This even happens now, in today's day and age. It was the French philosopher, René Descartes, who was the first scholar to accept Harvey's new theory. <laughs> He took his ideas a step further without any experimentation. Well, he argued that a heart was like a pump, or better yet, a combustion engine. But he questioned certain things. One of the questions 
that he raised and still remain was what, what makes the heart beat? Where is the control system? Because how we actually did not deal with the control system, he did not explain why and how the heart beats. And uh, Leonardo da Vinci had said, as to the heart, it moves itself and doth never stop, except it be for eternity. Now, many thought that the heart beats because it's uh, for, by way of the nerves. Others thought that uh, it was the heat of the blood that made the heart beat. And still others thought that it was God. It was a divine act. Finally, in the early part of the 20th century, uh, we actually came to know the electrical system of the heart. And the first discovery was made by Jan Evangelista Porchini, uh, who was a Czech physiologist in Prague. And he described what are known as the Purkinje fibers. Then it was a Swiss anatomist, Willem, his senior, in 1893, uh, who, descri who described the bundle, and it goes by his name as the bundle of his. And then it was Sunao Tabara, who was a Japanese pathologist working in Germany at the University of Marburg, who described the AV nerve. And the capstone came a little later, one year later, by a Scottish anthropologist and physician, Arthur Keith. Uh, he was looking for an assistant, and his grocer suggested his own son by the name of David Flack. And he created a laboratory in his home, and uh, he and Flack and uh, Keith were working on the uh, heart of the bowl. And one day, when uh, Keith was having a fun time with his wife and driving in the orchards with his horse, when he came back home, uh, he found Flack rather agitated. And he greeted them with Eureka. And he had found the, what we call as the sinus node which is the node that actually stimulates the heart. So in this figure, as we understand today, the sinoatrial node shown over there on top is actually over here. It's a special structure that initiates the heartbeat. And you can see that the heart is a muscle, but it also has an electrical system. By the way, life is, after all, electricity. When I'm speaking to you, when I'm raising my hands, all that is electricity within my body. There are sodium ions and potassium ions that go in the cell and out of the cell and generate electricity. And that's how I move my hands or I speak. So these electrical fibers that are shown in yellow <coughs> sense the stimulus down the heart and they are insulated so that they follow a pattern. They go down to the muscle bundles and then to the Purkinje network. At the cellular level shown on the right, electrical activation occurs through a special system consisting of opening and closing of gates or channels. These gates, like electrically charged ions, positive or negative, flow in and out of the cell, changing the voltage of the cell. Hence, their movement generates the electrical waveform known as the action potential. So this is happening all the time, and the action potential is shown on top, and that's how the electrical waveform is passed 
from the from within the heart to activate the muscle. And that system occurs throughout the body as well. Well, it took another almost 60 years to actually find the basic mechanism of sinus node automaticity. If you think about it, just imagine that your heart is beating all the time. Can't rain or shine. It never stops until you die. It is a fantastic uh, pacemaker. We call it a pacemaker. Because when you're asleep, it slows down. Because your body doesn't need uh, much uh, energy. When you're awake, it speeds up. If you're encountered with some disaster, or if you're chased by a tiger, your heart will zoom. And that's because of the sinus node. Now, the sinus node has a characteristic known as automaticity. It is different from all other structures. So it beats automatically. And that is genetically transmitted by a gene known as the HCM gene, which is shown on the right of the slide. I'm not going to go into the complexity of the slide because, it's, as you can see, it's very complex. There is a membrane plaque, there are potassium channels, calcium channels that go in and out of the cell to create automaticity. Uh, and it was discovered by the Milanese physiologist working at first at the University of Cambridge and then at Oxford. Well, we come before that, we come to a great man known as Dr. Wilhelm Eindhoven. Uh, he was born in Java, in Dutch Indonesia. By the age of 10, he came back to Holland and he became a doctor. In 1889, he attended the first International Congress of Physiology in Basel, Switzerland. And in this visit, changed his life trajectory and the course of medicine as well as the course of cardiology. There, Eindhoven saw a, the British Augustus Lee Waller record electrical waves from the heart. He worked to improve the recording by using a string galvanometer. And after a lot of work in 1906, he described the electrocardiogram that I'm sure most of you are uh, uh, aware. The electrocardiogram measures the electrical activity of the heart. And when we uh, cardiologists look at the electrocardiogram, we can make out some of the diseases of the heart, not all, because the electrocardiogram can be normal if you have, for example, coronary artery disease. But if you have had a heart attack, you can pick, up, pick it up on the ECG. Well, now we have a lot of other tests like an echo, uh, uh, CAT scans, MRIs, uh, transesophageal echo, and so on and so forth. Uh, there is a very interesting story about the ECG. Now, the waves of the electrocardiogram are labeled as P, which reflects the activation and contraction of the atrium. The QRS, which reflects the activation of the ventricle. The ST segment, which is basically diastole when the heart is resting. And the T wave. So, Eindhoven, more than 100, 125 years back, labeled it as PQRSP. Now, when I was answering my final uh, exams of MBBS, at Goa Medical College, which was then in Tangier, or current Tanajee. Uh, uh, our medical college was affiliated with the University of Bombay. And the examiners came from Bombay. And of course, uh, we were as students quite nervous and some trepidation because we did not know the examiners. It so happened that my examiner was Dr. Ivan Pinto, who was a famous cardiologist in Bombay. He was trained in, in London, and he had an MRCT in, in England. So he came to me, as usual, as you know, 
he, during the oral exams, he always nervous. He came to me and I told him the diagnosis of the patient. The patient had what is known as mitral stenosis, that is stenosis of one of the valves, which was very common in India at the time because of rheumatic fever it was very prevalent. And then he shows, shows me the EKG. And at that time, as medical students, all, all that we needed to know was PQRST. So he asked me the question, why is it PQRST and not A, B, C, D, E? Well, I didn't know the answer. So I looked at him and I said, sir, I'm sorry, I don't know the answer. Maybe it's nomenclature. He shook his head and he left. I was simply devastated because I thought that he was going to fail me. Later on, I came to know that he was my brother-in-law's uh, cousin, but uh, there was no contact with the brother-in-law, so I don't think he knew who I was, but maybe he, know, he knew, I don't know. Maybe he was joking around with me. And by the way, in those times, uh, Bombay still had prohibition. And when people from Bombay came to Goa, they had a lot of beers for their, for their meals. Even the examiners did. So who knows, maybe he was a little bit high from the, from the alcohol. And he was uh, sort of joking with me. But when I asked my professors the question, they didn't know the answer either. And then I forgot about it. And I, I went to the States as soon as I finished my internship. And whenever I had the opportunity, I asked the, my teachers there, and they did not know the answer either. So then I became a cardiologist, and I became a cardiac electrophysiologist, and I still did not know the answer. So 32 years later, there was an article in a, in a very prestigious journal known as Circulation, written by Willis Hurst from Emory University, and uh, the, the article, I think, was titled uh, The Naming of the ECG. And basically, it was then, 32 years later, I came to know why it is PQRST and not ABCDE. And apparently, Eindhoven did it. He used the middle of the alphabet because he thought that there may be waves discovered before the P. And there may be waves discovered after the T. And there was one discovered after the T, which is called the U wave. That is the main reason. The second reason was he did use initially A, B, C, D, but when he improved it, the EKG, the tracing, he switched to PQRST and probably was influenced by René Descartes, who was a philosopher, a French philosopher and who described analytical geometry as well, and he used P, P and Q. So just for interest, even now, when I ask my students, why is it PQRST and not A, B, C, D, E, they don't know the answer. But if you Google today, you'll find like 50 hits and all the answers are there. So we, are, we have come a long way in the, uh, in the dissemination of knowledge if we are interested. Finally, <clears throat> I have left some elements, but these are the four great people that I encountered in my sojourn as a cardiologist. And they changed and brought about cardiac electrophysiology. So this happened uh, about uh, something like 50 years after the discovery of the EKG. Before that, all our diagnosis was based on the EKG. Uh, Dr. Philippe Fumel from France and Dr. Hein Wellens from Holland, uh, they introduced a catheter through the vein in the leg, in the heart, and stimulated the heart and, in, and actually produced a cardiac arrhythmia. 
Dr. Anthony DeMarco, who was my mentor, and Dr. Benjamin Shola, uh, who worked with him, also introduced the catheter in the heart and recorded electrical activity from inside the heart. The combination of these two techniques actually uh, birthed the whole field of cardiac electrophysiology. Uh, Dr. Philip Kumar is no longer there, he passed away. Dr. Hein Wellen wrote the preface for my book, and unfortunately, he, is one of the, he was one of the premier cardiologists and cardiac electrophysiologists of Europe. He trained most of the cardiologists in, in Holland. He passed away just two, the, two months before my book was published. Dr. DeMarco passed away many years back. Dr. Ben Sherlock is still alive, he's 92, and still goes to the laboratory. Actually, he and I are sort of mine on a theoretical basis and philosophical basis are studying uh, afterlife. And he on a biological basis, and we, we still communicate with each other. And this is the slide showing the two most important studies that brought about a new field. As you can see on this slide, uh, this is the work of Dr. Wellens, where he introduces an extra beat and initiates a rapid rhythm that can cause death. And this is a slide showing the recording of the uh, electrical activity within the heart. So now we come to a very interesting uh, concept. Uh, can the heart feel emotions? Anybody wants to answer the question? Well, all of you all have heard the term, the broken heart syndrome. I'm sure that all, you know, my mother told me that uh, her cousin which was uh, very a relative which lived uh, in a house by the side of our house in Aldona, in Karana. She told me that uh, the, the mother died within 48 hours of her husband dying. I had a very interesting experience when I was a resident. And by the way, my uh, uncle, who was very close to his mother, died uh, four days after she died. He was very young. But in his case, he had hypertension, and I think he was so emotionally uh, overwhelmed with the death that he, his blood pressure skyrocketed and he bled in the brain, and he died four days after she died. It was, it was pretty tragic. He was, he was only in his 40s. Uh, I had an encounter in uh, some time when I was a resident at Down State Medical Center where a Haitian man from Haiti uh, who was living in Brooklyn, uh, he came to the emergency room and he said that I'm going to have a heart attack and die. Well, we are, you know, he denied any chest pain. We took a cardiogram, which was normal. His enzymes the, that uh, you know when you when you actually have a heart attack, you can measure enzymes in the blood that are seeped from the heart. Those were normal as well. Uh, so we told him there's nothing wrong with your heart. You can go home. He said, No, I'm going to die. So we called the psychiatrist, and he told a very interesting story to the psychiatrist. He said that. He was in Haiti, and he had an affair with his neighbor's wife. And the neighbor came to know about it, and he laid a voodoo curse on him. And he actually was told, he had already come to Brooklyn in New York, that a curse was laid on him. And he really believed in the curse. And therefore, he thought that he was going to die. So because of the amount of anxiety, he was admitted 
the disciple as he was, and the next morning he was found dead. You see, so at that time it was I I, I was uh, stupefied, but now we know, and uh, I have two wonderful uh, saying by one by G. H. Lawrence. For my heart, I prefer my heart to be broken. It is so lovely down kaleidoscopic within the crack. And by Emily Dickinson, if I can stop one heart from breaking, I shall not live in vain. In 1990, Dr. Hikaru Sato and colleagues in Japan described the prophet Sobo heart. It tends to occur after emotional stress, like the death or severe injury of a close family member. However, almost any severe stress can bring it on. It can happen after an earthquake, financial reverse, receipt of bad news, bad arguments, car accidents, a surprise reunion, a court appearance, a sudden big gambling loss or public speaking event. Sometimes there is no discernible trigger. And surprisingly, it happens more often in women than in men. We don't know why, but it's possible that women are much more sensitive to emotions than men. It may be a natural phenomenon of female versus male. The other element, obviously, is genetics. Uh, I am a strong believer in genetics, by the way. Uh, the environment does play a role, but not as strongly as our genetics. Now we believe that almost everything from cancer, uh, heart disease, uh, most of other diseases are genetically based as the, the environment does influence. So if you have a genetic predisposition, you add environmental causes, you will get the problem. If you don't have the gene, whether it is recessive or dominant, then you can be exposed and you won't develop the disease. The, so the pathophysiology of Prophet Sobo heart remains uncertain. However, it is thought that there is a big surge of adrenaline, that is catecholamines, and that damages the heart. The surge is so great it is even greater than after a myocardial infarction. And <clears throat> the Japanese describe this as tokutsobo, because tokutsobo is actually a pot that the Japanese use to catch uh, the octopus. They, they, they actually uh, put the pot in the water and the octopus comes and stays within the pot, and then they uh, take the pot and obviously uh, have a good meal on the octopus. And this is actually the middle channel, middle slide, shows the angiogram of the tokutsobo heart. And it is very akin to the, uh, the, the, the tokutsobo pot. So in essence, it is very likely possible that the broken heart syndrome is a true entity, and cardiologists for a very long time doubted it, but now we see more and more cases. The good thing about it is that 95% of the patients recover completely. Okay, only about 5% may have sudden cardiac death, or even less than 5%, probably 1% to 2%. But it is a real phenomenon. Now, I have spoken a lot about the heart, but what about the brain, actually? You see, it is the brain that is the seat of emotions, not the heart. <coughs> <coughs> Only in recent years, we have come to understand that love itself is a neurochemical phenomenon. It is the result of activity in several areas of the outer layers of the brain, the cortex, the medial insula, 
and the interior singularity in the nucleus accumbens in part of the striatum. And we call this now the emotional brain. So it is not the heart, actually, although, although the heart metaphorically has been linked for ages and still is being linked to emotions. Actually, functional magnetic resonance imaging scans have shown that when individuals look at the face of a person they love, certain parts of the brain light up. So now we come to the heart as metaphor. And basically, all that I've spoken to you is more history, some degree of philosophy, and some degree of literature of the heart. And most of it is metaphorical. Uh, this uh, dictum uh, by Robert Kizon, I would rather have eyes that cannot see, ears that cannot hear, lips that cannot speak, than a heart that cannot love. Again. So despite these advances, it's not surprising that the heart has remained the emblem of human emotions. If you ask someone what he or she associates with love, the heart springs to mind. We see it in the phrase, give your heart to, or on bumper stickers, I, heart, that is love, New York. And the heart is a symbol on Valentine's Day. It's not the brain. Pearl Buck wrote, the person who tries to live alone <coughs> will not succeed as a human being. His heart withers if it does not answer another heart. The heart stands for other qualities, many related to love. <coughs> I'm sorry. It is the center of us, a heart's desire, it is an inmost yearning, it is kindness. We say a cruel person doesn't have a heart. It is compassion, as in have a heart, the title of my most recent novel, and heart of gold. <coughs> it is commitment. We can no longer have the heart for the past. And we can have a change of heart. It is intuition, as in the little prince. <coughs> I'm sorry. I have a cold. And I'm almost done. Uh, it is only with the heart that one can see rightly. What is essential is invisible to the eye. It can be in a truth. We know things like in our hearts. Milan Kundera wrote in the unbearable likeness of being, when the heart speaks, the mind finds it indecent to object. It is commitment, courage, and love altogether. The poet Ted Hughes wrote, the only thing people regret is that they didn't live boldly enough, that they didn't invest enough heart, didn't love enough, nothing else really counts at all. The heart is immediate, it feels alive, like love, we know it's basic and profound. In conclusion, throughout history, the heart has occupied a lofty position, likened to a household divinity and the seat of emotions. Although, it is the brain that is the seat of human emotions. This characterization still remains today as ex exemplified by the innumerable metaphors attributed to the heart. The heart, on the other hand, is very much a dynamic electrical and mechanical organ, and engineers have modeled artificial hearts using these properties. It is the true engineering masterpiece just slightly larger than a fist, it beats incessantly about over 2 billion times over the average lifespan, assuming 70 beats per minute for 75 years. It beats day in, day out, without rest, come rain or shine, speeding up, etc., etc., etc. And metaphorically speaking, 
And from my heart to your heart, have a wonderful heart and a happy life. Uh, well, <coughs> this is my last slide. Uh, Anton Chekhov, who you might have heard, was a Russian doctor. Uh, he was a general practitioner, and uh, he was famous for his plays and uh, short stories. Actually, in English literature, he is considered the master of short stories. I don't write short stories, by the way. And he said that medicine is my lawful wife and literature my mistress. When I get tired of one, I spend the night with the other. But for me, since my semi-retirement, uh, literature has been both my lawful wife and my mistress. So, uh, thank you very much, and I will entertain any questions that you might have. Had. You can ask me questions on anything, on, uh, on uh, techniques or whatever, novel writing or whatever. Feel free. Doctor, something about your writing on Goa? Yeah, well, <coughs> yeah, sure. Well, as far as my, uh, as you know, my first novel, The Sting of Peppercorns, uh, I wrote poetry when I was in Dempe College. Uh, it wasn't great poetry, but uh, nonetheless, I think that uh, genetically I'm a writer. That's what I've concluded more recently. Uh, and sometime in 1984, I read uh, V.S. Naipaul, A House for Mr. Biswas. Uh, I was very impressed with the book, and uh, I thought of writing a novel based in Goa. But uh, that was before the age of the, of the computer, actually. So I sat on my desk and I tried writing, and it was just horrible that I gave up. But then I thought that I would come back someday to write a novel. It was something very powerful in me. So sometime in 1990, 1991, I started writing poetry, and then after writing uh, one book of poems, which was published in the U.S., I thought it was time to 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 try the novel. Now you see that I had no background in literature at all. I basically uh, was a student of science. Uh, in Dempe College, when I was doing, uh, you know, Aurora Court, who was my teacher. And we read poems of Shakespeare, uh, Elizabeth Barrett Browning, Keats, but nothing else. So for me, of course, when you're in medicine, uh, you're, you know, it's, uh, you're totally uh, involved, and all your time is spent in learning studying. So I never read literature at all until uh, the first book that I read was uh, V.S. Naipaul's uh, House for Mr. Biswas. And then I think uh, in 1990s, when I started writing poetry, uh, I had no background in poetry either. So I did a concerted effort. You know, I did not know the 21st century American poets or the Russian poets, 
So I bought books and I started reading on my own during my free time. And then after writing two books, I thought that um, po I feel that poetry is very personal. It is uh, there are two two the way I look at it. There is a poetry of the idea, and there is a poetry of the word. Uh, today, particularly in America, it is more the you know poetry is taught in writing schools, uh, and it's more a poetry of the word, not as much a poetry of the idea. And I felt that uh, poetry is very personal, and you have to go through suffering to really come out with good poetry. And I thought that I had done it all, I had enough, so I shifted back to fiction. And uh, the first novel that I wrote, The Sting of Peppercorns, uh, there are two ways of writing a novel. One is, uh, you have everything laid out in advance. Or the, the characters take over, and I prefer the latter. I know where the novel is going to start, and therefore, in The Sting of Peppercorns, I've written two poems. One is the Homecoming, and the second is The House. So these two poems were the crystallization of the novel. So the first chapter I knew, after that I also, I have always placed my fiction in some degree of real, a historical reality. So I knew that I would place it within the uh, context of the war and girls' liberation from colonialism. So that would be the main gist, and, uh, and I think you know that, that at that time when I lived in Goa, uh, there were, in a given family, there was a lot of controversy. There was a part of the family that was pro-Portuguese and wanted Goa to stay the way it was. There was another part that wanted Goa to be independent. And there was a third part that wanted Goa to be part of India. And that's what I, I knew that I had to explore that in the novel. So that's how the novel came about. Now, I had no idea about how to write a novel. So the first draft, uh, I have, since there are many students over here of literature, I have to tell you two most important things. Writing literature is rewriting and rewriting and rewriting and rewriting. Number one. So number two, you never know when it is complete. You know, because it, it is so subjective that what you think is good, somebody may like it and somebody may not like it. That's important. The third dictum is after you have written the draft, it's a good idea to forget about it for a month, or even six weeks maybe, or even six months, and then come back to it. Because then you would, you would find that you didn't like it at all, but you liked it when you first read it, when you first wrote it. So in my first novel, The Sting of Peppercorns, luckily I wrote it uh, during the age of computer where we can, you know, uh, save and then uh, have copy and paste and save. But otherwise, I don't know how the old people, the Russians, did it. You know, their, their novels were uh, uh, 2,000 pages long. I have no idea how they did it. So in this age, it's, it's simple. But So the novel went through a lot of stages, and I think I probably have 50 or 60 versions of the novel. So in terms of students, and if you don't mind if I just digress a little bit from your question, I think that in novel writing, uh, it is important, the characters are very important. Uh, you have to have a main protagonist. He's the one or she's the one who the, your reader is going to attach to. 
in knowing the story. So you have to have a strong protagonist. Then uh, a literary novel doesn't need to have a plot. But if you have a plot, uh, you know, it is more attractive to the reader. And then you have the arc of the story, which is basically, uh, you know, the introduction and the climax and down from the climax and the resolution. And the characters are very important. Now, uh, there's another thing which is also important, the third person narrative, which is basically a universal protagonist or the first person narrative. I personally prefer the third person, but nowadays, uh, the attention span of people, I don't know in India, but in the US, it's very bad. People, the attention span is very short. And uh, therefore, writing in the first person is probably more attractive to the reader than the third person. And, uh, and there are things like point of view, which are important if, uh, uh, you know, if the point of view is a one, from one character, you just cannot bring the point of view of the second character within that. You have to separate them. And uh, I think that uh, these are the tips. Now, coming back to your question, I don't, <coughs> I don't consider myself, you know, that I am a write, bone writer. I'm more international. Uh, the, the first, by the way, all diasporic writers, most of them, their first novel, if they write, it's always of their home. You know, you can take Salman Rushdie, you can take Arundhati Roy, you can take, uh, what is that, uh, uh, Leah Snipal, it's always from their home. And I think that when we when we leave our home, we have a, we we look at our home with a different viewpoint and a different vision. We also have the freedom, you know, uh, because we don't we don't entirely belong to the place. We are diaspora people. We try to uh, to uh, in our minds. We have this conflict that is our home. Is it our home of the past or is it our new home? But we have a longing for our home. But what do we call Saudaj in Portuguese? And therefore, we essentially, our first novel is always of our home. And that's true of all diasporic writers. And then we branch into. So uh, I. <coughs> My next novel, uh, Have a Heart, doesn't have anything to do with Goa. And the main protagonist is a Muslim. And it has to do something with 9-11. Uh, the more recent novel that I've written, uh, Life in the Shadow of Death, uh, which has not been published, but is set out, uh, deals with COVID. And the characters, are, the, there are Indian characters uh, in the novel, mostly doctors, uh, but it has nothing to do with Goa. And the other novel that I've written, again not published, the title Dr. Delirium explores uh, schizophrenia uh, in a doctor uh, who is brilliant but sch schizophrenic. Uh, so uh, in answer to your question, I think that the, the Sting of Peppercorns, my, my uh, first novel, that is uh, the first collection of poems, Visions of Gainesville, as well as Mirrored Reflections that you published, uh, has elements of Goa. But now, you know, I consider myself more international. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah. <coughs> Mentioned 
खुबसे जो केस आसता ते केसाचे जर शंभर कुडके केले ताजे जर शंभर कुडके केले तितलो आसता तो वेरी मॅक्रो साइज आसता तेची सो इन युअर करियर हॅव यू कम अक्रॉस सच थिंग्स ऑर वॉट इज युअर ओपिनियन ऑन सच कन्सेप्ट ऑफ द कन्सेप्ट ऑफ हार्ट अँड सोल इन द कॉन्टेक्स्ट ऑफ इंडियन मायथोलॉजी ऑर Well, that's a, you know that's an interesting question and a rather difficult question. But I think that the soul has nothing to do with the heart. If at all we believe that there is a soul, if anything, it's probably in the brain or somewhere in the body. I mean, I don't know, but it resides in the heart. As and mythologically, obviously, it was. Uh, the heart it was thought to be in the heart because the heart is the only organ you can feel you know you can't feel the liver you really can't feel the brain but it is the brain that is doing all the thinking now in my view uh i have written an article and i will send it to you if you want it was published uh, i don't remember the title but but it deals Uh, with the after death and uh, according to uh, some degree of hindu thought and theoretical physics you see if you look at einstein equation um, mc square you see energy doesn't uh, decay energy may be converted to something else okay so there are two elements here one is is near that experiences there are patients who have nearly died who actually uh, most of them will tell you that they go to a tunnel of scintillating lights they also see the ancestors on the other side and uh, when you shock them electrically and bring them back you see they come back to the body i i have had my patients tell me sometimes that when they were having a cardiac arrest they have gone out of their body they have been able to see their body from outside and there are reports of this there's there are studies and there are publications in the lancet for example where somebody uh, who had cardiac surgery was under anesthesia and the heart was stopped the patient knew what was going on and the patient was outside so that suggests that there is a soul okay? and all that energy that we have see everything is energy mass and energy so our brain has mass we think that for the are and, and and for the for the process of thinking or any process there is energy that is expanded so that the question is where does this energy go so my uh, friend my colleague Dr. Ben Shalom, what he did is he took a single cell and he killed the cell by by using cellie. Uh, and what he found that the cell separated. There was a mirror image. This is shown biologically, and it's in my book actually. The that the, yeah that book. Uh, he showed biologically the separation which is which is very akin to the um, you know the what i mentioned of uh, the person seeing his body uh, it's of interest that uh, the portuguese poet um, uh, what's his name now i forgot his name said that the dead body is like a suit that is left behind uh and so uh, what he showed is that there is a separation of the cell a mirror image and then when he brought the cell to life 
the sun wasn't totally killed, then that mirror image merged into the light cell. This has been published. So he, like me, in my uh, contribution, when he uh, contribution is that uh, energy cannot be destroyed. It's converted to other forms of energy. So therefore, the question is, where does this energy within us goes after we, we are dead? So if you, if you want to call it the soul, the energy, obviously, you know, is something to be considered. But I don't think that it's located in the heart. I think that that what it's mostly, whatever you want to say, maybe in our body, in our mind, in our mind or whatever. But the heart is metaphorically used because I think it was the only organ that, our, that people, the Egyptians or the Indians or whatever could feel. That we couldn't feel the rest of the body. Yes. Yeah, uh, it, it, let me repeat your question. You mentioned about tachycardia. Yeah, so right. Well, I think you should know better than me because problem with yoga, you know, and meditation. You know, uh, those are the two things uh, which uh, Indians are famous for, and uh, it's thought all, all over the West. We also, it is not easy, but meditation and yoga probably is the best thing to control your emotions and consequently the heart rate. But you see, the, the, the emotions, uh, uh, you know, basically the heart rate goes up and you develop tachycardia because of the attributes of pride. In your course of uh, your three engagements, have you unearthed some truths of heart or mysteries of heart that you had not done as a cardiologist? Sorry, uh, in your course of uh, literary engagements, have you discovered some truths <coughs> around mysteries of human heart that you had not done as a cardiologist? Well, I think that. <coughs> Yeah, I think that mostly in the broken heart syndrome, I've had, you know, to give you an example, I had a patient uh, whose uh, daughter died of cancer, and also her husband died of cancer. And uh, they occurred quite sequentially, and she blacked out once. She started having chest discomfort. She thought it was from uh, uh, reflux, she took some myelanta, and then uh, one day she blacked out again, she called the emergency uh, people, and they came and found out that she was in rapid, you know, rapid heartbeat. Uh, that is ventricular tachycardia, which is incompatible with life, so they shocked her. She's one of those who told me also that she saw her ancestors, she was detached from her body, She's, she was going in a tunnel with scintillating lights. And uh, she had the top of sober heart. You know, her heart was enlarged uh, and aneurysmal, and she recovered completely. So I think that uh, in, my own, uh, in my own experience, Literature has given me, uh, what is that, I would say, uh, lit literature and writing has given me much more input to the psychology of disease and the suffering of, the, of my patients, of the mortals. Because in today's day and age, 
doctors don't have the time. You know, they just, uh, they don't even examine you anymore. They just look at the cardiogram or an x-ray or an echo report. And they, 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 they are not, uh, you know, uh, so for, for example, I'm, I'm uh, of the old time. Uh, I, if I don't use the stethoscope, I feel uh, guilty. Not that I hear anything anymore, but, but I just, you know, it's a habit for me. They, doctors do that nowadays, they don't want to deal with, uh, the, you know. But for me, since I'm a writer, uh, I, I like uh, the association with my patients has made me a better doctor, being a writer. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for your attention and all the best.